Um, it's wonderful to be introduced by a Scot in Jerusalem um, as the director of uh, a festival in Scotland uh, where I am also uh, an expatriate because I'm a Yorkshireman. Um, I don't like describing myself as English these days because um, I don't like the, the sound of that. So both my children are Scottish and I, and I feel more and more Scottish as time goes by. But it's a great honour and pleasure to be here and I'm so thrilled that you've all come. My job is to, to explain a little bit about the, the genesis of this project uh, of which I am exceptionally proud. And to do that I really need to explain a bit about the Edinburgh International Book Festival of which I've been director for the past six years. And the book festival, in Britain at least, is routinely described as the biggest and the most successful literary festival in the world. Now, we think that's true in Britain, but I, I realise that the Brits have a habit of overstating their case very often. But we try at least to live up to that reputation. Of, uh, and it's certainly true that we're big. We have 800 writers who attend the book festival every year over the course of 18 days, who speak in events not dissimilar to this in eight theatres, uh, in a park where we build the theatres every year. The biggest theatre is 600 seats and the smallest theatre is probably about the size of this audience, um, something about 80 people. Um, 220,000 people come along to these discussions and just as important as the writers coming is the readers who come along. Um, they take part in discussions, debates, they hear performances, they hear readings, they hear poetry, uh, they hear plays, they hear new authors, they hear celebrities. It's an extraordinary experience, as, as Penny and Roger know, because they come most years, and it's, it's, a, one, it's a pleasure to have them taking part. Um, at this time of year, when I'm programming the following year's festival, I, I always ask myself, uh, in a slight slough of despond, what on earth am I doing it for? Why do I put together this enormous festival? What's the point? And I can assure you that the point is not simply to sell tickets, or to sell books. It's much more than that. We're a charity. Um, we don't exist to make a profit. We exist in order to try to help engage writers and readers. When I ask myself why we do that, I think that the answer is because readers and writers are citizens and that taking part in conversations like this one is an act of, of shared citizenship, the like of which is, is more and more difficult to, to feel in these days of, of the internet age. So much of our life is atomized, individualized, and getting together in a group and sharing conversation about the way society is going seems to be very important. And I think that explains why literary festivals in the UK, France, Germany, America, and lots of other parts of the world are proliferating. There are hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of festivals going on. So active citizenship is what we encourage. Um, every year I program around a, a particular thematic focus, and. Uh, in 2014, so 18 months ago, there was a, it was a particularly interesting situation in Scotland because Scotland was coming up towards its referendum on independence. And um, if any of you were able to be there, it was an, an, an extraordinary experience to be in Scotland at that time. Um, because whichever side people started off on, they all ended up with one shared conclusion, which was that they had taken part in this massive act of shared democracy, proper democracy, and it made them realise at a stroke that the kind of democracy we'd been offered from Westminster really hadn't been working for us. Whether or not they voted yes or no, that was a common conclusion that we take part in something that matters. So my, my festival theme that, that year was around dialogue. It was around the idea that, that whether or not we agree, dialogue is, is a, a really important part of society listening to each other, stating our views, disagreeing, and learning something in the process. And it was against that backdrop drop of, the, of the need for dialogue, and for the need to avoid any kind of partisan uh, splitting of, of the population, 58% uh, one way, 40, 42 the other, whatever it would turn out to be. The need for dialogue led me to invite Raja Shahada to be one of the festival's guest selectors. And his job as guest selector was to invite authors around a particular theme that, that mattered to him. And the theme he chose, to, slightly to my surprise, I must say, was not just the Israeli-Palestinian issues, but the wider question of the Middle East, past, present, and possible futures across the Middle East region, uh, and the need for dialogue around that. 
And I was really captivated by that as an idea, and I was thrilled with the project. Um, I'll leave Raja and Penny to discuss the exact nature of how those uh, discussions unfold, unfolded. Suffice it to say that, um, well, one thing that was that there was a really interesting mixture of authors that Raja and Penny had proposed, people from their network, who didn't necessarily have a new book to promote, but also there were authors from the book festival's network who Raja and Penny didn't necessarily know. And we managed to bring them together to create something which couldn't have happened the one without the other. So it was a genuinely shared project and a shared enterprise. So interesting and uh, engaged were the discussions that took place over five hours uh, in Edinburgh in 2014 that we were approached by uh, Andrew Franklin, publisher based in London, um, who has regularly published uh, books by Raja in the past, to say that these were some of the most interesting discussions he'd heard on the subject ever. And he really, really thought we, sh we should publish the transcriptions of the discussions. And Raja and Penny and I thought briefly about this and realized that publishing what people say on stage isn't necessarily going to give the best, um, the, the best arguments. So people say things on stage and they think afterwards, I could have put that slightly better. So we embarked on a project where we invited the participants to write essays, uh, which followed the theme of the discussions that we'd had. And those essays are now published in this book, Shifting Sands, which, was, which we launched one year later at the Edinburgh International Book Festival this August 2015, uh, in another exuberant and memorable discussion. And so for me, the whole project has, has started something really, really interesting. And I think it's, the, it's a book the like of which hasn't been seen before. But it was very important to us that this discussion should also should not simply take place in Scotland or in the UK, but that it, that it should take place also here. And this is the moment where I, where I hand over to you now to carry on the story. But it's, it's a great pleasure that we can now be here and, and hear your views on this, on this topic. And I'm just very proud that we, we are here tonight. Uh, thank, thank you, Nick, for this introduction. Uh, the subtitle of this book is The Unraveling of the Old Order in the Middle East. And uh, the hope is that uh, with the resistance, there will be an unraveling of this tenacious occupation, which, of course, someday will happen. I want to start by thanking uh, Mandy Turner for co-sponsoring this and providing this oasis of uh, tranquility in the midst of uh, turbulence and Mahmoud and the bookstore, the educational bookstore, for their continued support of authors and books, which has really made a big difference, as you all probably know. Uh, I want to uh, not go through what uh, Nick has put forward very eloquently, but just to say that... Just speak uh, up a bit. Oh. Just speak a bit louder there. Can you be in? Uh, I, want to, I don't want to go through what uh, Nick has already described about the uh, genesis of the book, but just to say that when the uh, proposal for the publishing of the uh, uh, panels came forward, my first reaction was, was really negative. And I said, I will only do it if Penny agrees to be a co-editor. And Penny did agree, and uh, she has had a tremendous input. And uh, the work, I think, of editing the book fall, fell almost entirely on her shoulders. And as you will see from reading the book, it's, it's a very well edited book. And she, of course, provided as well the introduction. Um, the, the good thing, I think, is when uh, a couple, a married couple work on a book together, they, they can get into dire straits. But uh, I think that uh, the proof that it wasn't like that is at the end, we didn't say never again. <laughs> uh, I will well, turn it over to. Gap. <laughs> <laughs> I will turn it over to Penny to describe the book, and then I will read a bit from the uh, afterward. First, really, thank you, everybody, for coming. I mean, one often gives a pro forma thanks, but I think in this situation, it is really a heartfelt thanks that that you came to hear about this book and to discuss with us. Really, a million thanks. Uh, my brief presentation could really be called What I Learned from Editing Shifting Sands. 
Now, editors, among their other functions, and I think most writers would think their main function is sustained and terrible nagging. But among their other functions, editors are probably the, they're the first readers and the close readers uh, of a book. Uh, and I hope other readers of Shifting Sands will be as engaged and stimulated by the 15 essays in Shifting Sands as I was. And I am particularly grateful to all the writers for taking me beyond my immediate preoccupations. And I do think there may be a disease called Palestine centrism. And into not just the crises in our regions, but into a place to sort of reflect and think about. And I should say, you, you might notice the book is not huge. Uh, it's 15 essays, and an essay uh, in the old sense of people trying out what are deeply informed ideas, but are also arguments, points of view, ways of understanding. Um, it's not an academic tome, and it's not a comprehensive survey of the region. It's people who are thinking about uh, places and problems that deeply concern them. Now, our contributors, of course, like everybody else, are writing in the tense and I think often tragic aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, if you think of the slogans that were raised in Tahrir Square and elsewhere throughout the region, for dignity, for democracy, for the unity of people, and of course, in one powerful word to entrenched power, leave. Erhan. Well, indeed, some dictators did leave, and I think most of us have some hope still in the Tunisian transition. For now, the dreams of social justice and dignity for many in our region are not only largely dashed, but engulfed in flames. But I, hauntingly, at least for me, one slogan in Tahrir Square seems to have come true, but in a twisted form we would not have thought of in 2011. And that slogan is no more forever. Then it meant that all the perpetual struggles, uh, seemingly perpetual structures of power and inequality would not last. Now, it seems to mean that nothing lasts. Nothing lasts in the region, including perhaps a number of states. Nothing in the Middle East is stable, even perhaps the seemingly eternal and ever-growing Saudi royal family. And indeed, what seemed like a frozen situation here in Palestine, Israel, has now erupted. It is this shifting terrain, the shifting sands of our title, that our contributors hope to help readers to navigate through a century of crisis and wars, colonial powers, new borders and fragile states, great cities, and unending conquest, authoritarian power, and people's civic resistance. To understand this shifting terrain, our book went back 100 years. Because as the American writer William Faulkner so aptly said, the past is never dead. It is not even past. And when, then went on to examine our present tensions in the light of the past. I want to just take you, with perhaps a little bit less than half of our contributors, on a whirlwind tour of the essays to give you uh, at least a flavor of what people are writing and thinking about in this book. Selim uh, Tamari, who could not be with us today as he had a talk in Beirut, and we might ask if it's easier to get to, to Beirut uh, from Ramallah than to Jerusalem, but you can ask yourself, reminds us of the immense physical devastation of World War I, whereby one-sixth of the population of greater Syria died of war, famine, or disease. But Salim does something else that's very important. He shows us how that war reshaped lives and ruptured identities. He brings uh, us memoirs and diaries of soldiers and civilians that attest to these transformations. One example would be the Ottoman soldier and loyalist, Araf uh, Shahadi, who was later the Palestinian historian and nationalist, Araf al -Araf, who becomes an Arab nationalist in a Siberian prison camp. Selim also notes saliently that war and devastation can trigger reversions to local identities. And I think this is something we witness today throughout the whole region. So he helps us understand the present through looking at people's lives in the past. 
historian Avi Schlem coined a very useful phrase, I think, to describe the dynamics of our region for the hundred years after World War I. He calls it the post-Ottoman syndrome, which he characterizes as a lack of legit legitimacy of many of the colonial created states, uh, resulting in turmoil, instability, and a deficit of rights. Perhaps this sounds all too familiar. And I want to just pause and give one example uh, from uh, his, his chapter that I think is quite relevant because he talks about Iraq. And he gives the example, which probably many of you know, uh, of uh, the British, and particularly Sir Percy uh, Cox and his sidekick, sidekick Gertrude Bell, basically inventing a throne for what we might call a spare prince because Faisal had been deposed in Damascus. But he also says that the British uh, expelled uh, uh, Tayyip Saleh, or sorry, Saleh Tayyip, who was leading a movement of Iraq for the Iraqis. And I want to make this point because it is not as though there is no Iraq and there are no Iraqi people. Uh, what we are talking about is the problem of status pro uh, projects, of borders that were drawn by, uh, by colonialism. And I'm saying this because last week, I think in Haaretz, Moshe Arons wrote, the former Israeli defense minister wrote a op-ed saying, uh, there is no Iraq. And I think that is not the direction we want, to, we want to go when we're thinking about the lack of legitimacy of status projects and colonial created states. Now, in, our, in Shifting Sands, Tamim El Barghouti explores, explores the past and present contradiction of these colonial created Arab states. He argues, uh, and I think this is quite interesting, that for domestic legitimacy, these states had to oppose colonial power, and for international recognition, they had to collaborate. So, so there is a very major tension. He calls them cracked cauldrons unable to perform the functions for which states were invented to defend and protect their citizens. Their structural failures have ushered in a new phase that we are in now, where he argues narratives are replacing structures, and ideas, for better or worse, are replacing leaders. And I cannot do justice to Tanum's intriguing analysis, but just to note for our discussion that ideas replacing leaders and narratives replacing structures may have some resonance to what we witness in Jerusalem today. Tanum's contribution often also offers a searing poem, because he's also a poet, that he wrote during the 2014 war against Gaza, which says to us that political analysis can be accompanied by imagination. Uh, and several of our contributors explore the role of that imagination and fiction in understanding our present reality. Kuwaiti writer and scholar, Maya Lakib, argues that it is a mirage that the Gulf states are living what she called, very uh, succinctly, an air-conditioned bubble in hell. And she finds fiction's imagination a way to fight the cultural amnesia of her society. For example, the erasure of the Palestinian presence and their contribution to Kuwait, as well as Kuwait's lost cosmopolitan history. So that's another direction the book takes, is to think about imagination. Two of our contributors, Aleph Scott and Ramita Navai, widen our lens from the Arab region and into the key regional sites of Turkey and Iran, respectively. And I learned a great deal from Aleph's essay both about the sobering developments in Turkey after this hopeful moment of Gezi Park in 2011, but also encouraging signs. For example, Aleph listens to Berevan. She's a former child bride, no formal education, and she wanders into addressing a crowd in a rural town as if she's just coming out of the crowd. And what she talks about is women and their right to education and work. A few days before we went to press, Aleph wrote frantically from Istanbul to add an analysis of the June 2015 Turkish elections. Berevan's party, the People's Democratic Party, a pro-Kurdish, pro-women's rights, a multi-ethnic party that mobilized many marginalized groups in Turkey, had won a very surprising 13% of the vote. 
So against all these exclusions, against all the separation of people and power in our region, we have to put what Aleph calls civic courage. And her essay certainly helped me understand the courage of participants in the pro-peace rally in Ankara a few days ago, organized by the People's Democratic Party and Turkish trade unions, in which at least 100 people lost their lives. Civic courage, indeed. And just to add a very sad connecting thread, among the fatalities was a young teacher from Gaza. Now, I would hesitate to make any generalizations from even reading these essays about the Syrian tragedy. And I think there are too many generalizations already. But what I learned from these, the three essays in, on Syria in Pakistan is the usefulness of thinking about Syria sometimes at an angle. For example, Don Chatty examines two groups, the Syrian Kurds and the Syrian mobile tribes or Bedouins who themselves are at an angle from the status projects of the last hundred years and who are, play, who are playing an increasing role that recalls older affinities. And Malou Halassa evokes those arch anglers, cultural rebels, cartoonists, graffiti artists, puppeteers, who through their artistic and media interventions, sometimes at great cost to themselves, do try to imagine a new Syria. In reviews of Shifting Sands so far, the most quoted sentence, I mean, there is always a kind of soundbite, I think, comes from historian and Tahrir Square activist Khalid Fahmi, who asks, how did the Arab Spring morph into an Arab nightmare? But instead of quick answers, Khalid probes five deep problems and provides one intangible resource, which is hope. But I would turn our attention as well to a series of questions he also explores when he is asked after the revolution to become its archivist. He first asks a very hard question, it turns out, when did the revolution begin? And then he asks, why were we demonstrating? He finally goes on to inquire, were we protesting against the very nature of the modern Egyptian state? Several reviewers have also remarked that if shifting sands cannot provide all the answers to the crises in the Middle East, which nobody can, I think nobody would claim to do, it does ask the right questions. A book, I think, offers a quieter space for these questions and for engagement with a reader like myself that media does not usually allow. allow. And, the, and that's why it is appropriate that shifting sands emerged from a book festival and from an engagement with a and the audience at Edinburgh, uh, a republic of letters that I think both, all of us cherish here. Now I'm going to turn it over. We uh, originally in the panels, there was no, uh, we decided the one country focus would be Syria. And uh, Palestine came in in various contributions, but not with a single focus. Uh, when we did the book, uh, Richard wrote an afterword called Palestine and Hope, hopefully entitled Palestine and Hope, that brings some of the themes of shifting sands a bit closer to home. So I'm going to turn it over to Reja, our single copy of Shifting Sands. I have to <laughs> move it along. Well, I think the reason why we didn't want to focus on Palestine because we thought it would steal the show and uh, distort everything. So. Uh, it's, uh, I will read from parts of the afterword, Palestine and Hope. The Middle East of my youth was a very different place from what it is now. In a small instance of an issue... The Middle East of my youth was a very different place from what it is now. In a small instance of an issue that looms large in the cultural politics of today, I don't remember hearing a discussion about whether women should wear the hijab. Whether or not a woman chose to wear the headscarf was a personal choice, not that or even necessarily to indicate religious affiliation. In Palestine and the several Arab countries I experienced, there seemed to be an acceptance that religious practice and observance was a personal choice. 
there was generally tolerance and acceptance of the different faiths. Yet, yes, there were, there were fanatics, zealots, and just pure crazies. Palestine has had a share of all these throughout history. But for the rest of us, political hardships could not be blamed on religion. In 1967, the long-awaited war with Israel took place. The ensuing disaster changed everything. In the words of Israeli General and Minister of Defense Moshe Dayan, Israel now became an empire. Israel was on the march, colonizing more of the occupied Palestinian territories through building Jewish settlements and doing all that was possible to encourage the Palestinians to leave. Not only did the Arab world follow the travails of the Palestinians with a profound sense of frustration, it watched in bewilderment the success of the Israelis, including their effective use of the media to impress on the world Israel's own mythical and exclusive versions of the history of our country. No less disturbing to the ordinary Palestinians and Arabs was the bias Ever violations of international law it was committing. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, the ISIL, seems to thrive on the frustration of people facing seemingly insurmountable obstacles in the fight for greater rights and freedoms within their own states and the failure of the Palestinians to win the liberation of their land occupied by Israel over four decades earlier through the reliance on peaceful resistance and invocation of the rule of law. The cause of law, whether municipal or international, as a vehicle for peaceful change and transformation was not furthered by the wide definition of U.S. law, which the U.S. law gave to terrorism, that rendered legitimate resistance to occupation and oppression as illegal. ISIL seems to have learned dangerous and brutal lessons from the repeated failure of Arab states and armies in their fight against Israel and West the Western powers. How to manipulate the media, perhaps from Israel's noted success? how to be cured of illusions about the democracy of the West from the actions of the West itself. Discredited rhetoric about the rule of law and democracy and the absence of both in the Arab regimes the West has supported both undermines the status, state's ISIL challenges and leaves people without these powerful tools to fight their own battles against ISIL barbarism. These lessons and legacies are proving chillingly effective in ISIL's control of the Syrian and Iraqi territories it has conquered. Speaking to the BFM TV in the wake of the January 2015 attacks in France that killed 17 people, the former French Prime Minister, Dominique de Villepin, who led the opposition to the Iraq war, described the Islamic State as the deformed child of Western policy. He wrote in Le Monde, that the West's wars in the Muslim world nourish terrorism among us with promises of eradicating it. This is a quote. His analysis was right, as was his warning, against simplifying these conflicts in the Middle East by, quote, seeing only the Islamist symptom, unquote. It is hoped that this book will have made it possible for readers to better understand the issues at stake in the Middle East and to think beyond simplistic paradigms and sound bites. As the authors of the essays here have ably demonstrated, writers have an important role to play in bringing about change, not only by analyzing what is taking place, but also by imagining how things could be different. In this way, writers can ultimately tilt the balance and encourage the victory of those with positive energy, creative energy, over those with, which, who espouse the negative energy of terror and violence. These essays have demonstrated that the energy creation of creation is still alive, whether in Egypt, Syria, or Iraq, even in the darkest of times and the seemingly most desperate of places.
Thank you.